This video is brought to you in part by Dave.com. More on them in a bit. If I had to ask you what the highest rated handheld game of all time is on any handheld console, what would you say? You might look at the topic of this video and think this is an easy one, but the answer is Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 2 on the Game Boy Advance, don't ever assume. Second place, though, well, it's a game called Flipnote Studio if we remove remasters of console games, but at least Grand Theft Auto is tied with it, as both Flipnote and GTA are the top-rated Nintendo DS games of all time. You may not even remember that a GTA game ever came out on Nintendo, but the truth is that four of them did, including two ambitious ports of Grand Theft Auto's 1 and 2 on the Game Boy Color, a GTA 3 prequel for the GBA, and Grand Theft Auto Chinatown Wars, 2009's handheld game of the year, and I'm going to guess the only DS game that lets you deal drugs. Oh, sorry, dwugs. It's a little difficult to remember in the modern era of Grand Theft Auto V, Grand Theft Auto V again, the buggy, critically panned, AI upscaled, heavy air quotes, definitive edition of what were some of the most coveted PS2 games ever, and even more Grand Theft Auto V, but there was a good decade run where the three letters GTA were synonymous with hardware innovation, with genuinely great games that doubled as technical powerhouses, and with a lot of them. From GTA's original release in 1997 to the conclusion of the GTA 4 saga in 2009, there were 10 full Grand Theft Auto games plus 4 expansions released. Counting the ports of GTA 1 and 2, 6 of those were handheld games, and yet despite some of them being among the highest selling GTAs or the highest rated GTAs, these have flown under the radar in recent years, with one to this day being delisted and unavailable for purchase on any storefront. With the two ambitious PlayStation Portable prequels, Liberty City Stories and Vice City Stories, how was Rockstar's handheld team able to faithfully recreate those huge cities on a much more limited system? How did they translate what were undoubtedly console powerhouses into the palm of your hand without compromising too much? How did they attempt to make a rated M Game Boy Advance prequel to Grand Theft Auto 3 uh, three years after 3's release, at the end of that handheld's life, and try to have it hold its own while releasing on the very same day as San Andreas? How did Chinatown Wars end up being the highest rated multi-platform handheld game ever, and why is it commonly referred to as the most complex DS game ever made? These questions don't even begin scratching the surface of these nowadays overlooked titles in one of the biggest game franchises of all time, so let's dig into them today. These are the stories of the portable Grand Theft Auto games. Now, normally I would tend to go through the history of these games in chronological release order, but I'm going to save the Game Boy games for the end so that all of the top-down styled games can be nice and cozy together. So first, we're going to start with the GTA style you're more familiar with, and that brings us to the PlayStation Portable. First up is 2005's Grand Theft Auto Liberty City Stories, which, like most of the best PSP games, ended up also releasing on PlayStation 2 a year later, with some marginal differences to things like the game's multiplayer mode and textures, etc. I'm, of course, playing the portable version, albeit with some visual smoothing and some upscaling to make it a bit easier to both watch and to play. LCS takes place in 1998 in the very same Liberty City featured in Grand Theft Auto 3, only three years earlier in the timeline and with a bunch of really cool changes. Also, I guess maybe spoiler warning for GTA 3 and Vice City if you if you care, none of you care. The story puts you in the shoes of Tony Cipriani, a member of the Leone mob family at the center of GTA 3 proper and the same family that tends to have a hand in the entire pre-HD saga of games to begin with, really. Over the course of the game, we'll see Tony work his way up the ranks in the family, going from the bottom rung to actually like the top rung within probably 10 missions or so, and then staying there because they don't really show anybody else in the family after that. It's kind of it's weird. The rest of the game after that point serves to set up a bunch of small details in the main GTA 3 storyline that nobody really asked about and didn't really need any setting up. You don't really have a reason to grow to like Tony or anything, he's just kind of a grunt doing missions because he's told to. Like with pretty much every early GTA story, Tony's just arrived back in the city at the start of this game, having spent a few years in hiding after killing a made man from another family. 
The focus of this game's plot is to set up the Leone family as the city rulers that they're seen as in GTA 3, through a bunch of, frankly, really stupid plot points that I still kind of enjoy. Like, the game quickly jumps from Tony showing up to almost immediately being set up and betrayed by one of the family's capos, a character who is completely forgotten about afterwards until he tries to kill you again in a Texas Chainsaw Massacre mission on a random cargo boat. Breeze! Don't move, asshole! I don't know why this is a thing, but it's also one of the most annoying missions in the game, because you can't move while you aim in this game, so therefore, uh, when you're fighting a bunch of chainsaw men, and you can't and you can't move, and they can hit you once and you instantly die, it's, it's no bueno, and uh, this game doesn't have checkpoints, as we'll get into later, so uh, you, should, you should use save states. Tr trust me. But not before Tony Cipriani deals with mommy issues. If you couldn't tell by the name, this is a very unsubtle Tony Soprano parody, all the way down to having a hateful mother that tries to undercut him and his place in the Mafia. In the first hour or so of this game, she calls assassins on you because you're not cut out to be a mobster like your father, apparently, and then you're just dealing with the occasional hitman chasing you down for the first half or so of the game until Tony becomes a made man and mom calls off the hit. I just heard you've been made! I never doubted you for a second, son. With how heavily the early GTAs take from every mob story in the books, this shouldn't be a surprise, of course, and if you know GTA 3, you know that both of the Cipriani's are also lightly featured in that game as well. Now, when I say first half of the game, I should go back and note that this is the third longest Grand Theft Auto story. It's got one more mission than GTA 5, and it's only behind 4 and San Andreas in terms of total mission count. Depending on how you want to count the game's side missions, which include some races, time challenges that task you with wreaking havoc on the city, or dishing out biker justice by killing criminals, that kind of stuff, this game is only really behind San Andreas, which is insane because remember, this is a PlayStation Portable game, one that released only about half a year after the system's North American launch. Not only that, it's a game that was released 364 days, just under a year, after San Andreas. How could they manage that outside of constant back-breaking crunch? Well, there was probably a good amount of that, too, but actually, this was the first 3D GTA title developed outside of the main team at Rockstar North. While that team was focusing on developing San Andreas from late 2002 through 2004, its sister studio, Rockstar Leeds, took the reins on this handheld spin-off, and essentially had to rework a ton of what made Grand Theft Auto tick from the ground up, while starting with Vice City's base, not San Andreas's. Where the mainline Grand Theft Auto games used the Renderware engine to handle their graphics rendering, the Leeds team had to fork off a heavily modified version that essentially became its own rendering engine to cater to the PSP's much different, much weaker hardware specs. To transfer everything over one-to-one -one would have led to huge issues with constant pop-in, loading issues, and not being able to render the amount of different characters or vehicles on screen at once that would be needed to emulate this bustling cityscape. Additionally, they were limited by the PSP's disc format. UMDs only had 1.8 gigabytes available in space, less than half of what the PS2's DVDs could work with at the time. How could you achieve the now-expected GTA experience with a city that didn't feel lively or was full of freezes or stops or loading screens or without a number of radio stations to draw you into the setting and keep you entertained with all of the sardonic commentary you'd expect from this series? It honestly shouldn't have been possible so soon in the PSP's lifetime, really, and yet the biggest compromise that this game had to take is that it will cut to a little loading screen when you're crossing bridges or taking the ferry between each of the game's three islands. Other than that, and obviously again some draw distance things, this is the full GTA experience on a handheld. It's got ten full radio stations, one more than both GTA 3 and Vice City had, as well as an eleventh radio station similar to both of those games' Xbox and PC versions that lets you use your own saved MP3s. The city feels remarkably lived in thanks to all of the tall buildings limiting how far the game would usually need to draw, meaning that more power can go into rendering more vehicles or pedestrians instead. Surprisingly, it does this without relying exclusively on cloning whatever car you're driving as well. There's a variety of vehicles almost all the time. Liberty City's not just a straight one-to-one -one recreation of GTA 3's either, as many buildings are changed or under construction to play into the whole prequel thing. Many of the tunnels and bridges between the islands aren't finished yet, so there's a new fair system that you can take. Some of the high-rise buildings are still under construction. There's an entire neighborhood in this city that's very different in 3. We'll get to that one in a bit. And my favorite little bit of prequel lore, this game has motorcycles. Now, Rockstar didn't add bikes into the mix until Vice City, so to explain this little retcon, it's stated that one of the car manufacturers pushed the city to ban motorcycles sometime between Liberty City Stories and GTA 3 to try and boost their car sales. 
Very few of these changes seem to have been made to compromise and fit the game better onto the PSP though, these were mainly stylistic changes. I mention them because it shows the effort that went into not just making this a direct translation of GTA 3's world, and instead trying to give the countless players that spent hours and hours exploring Liberty City something new to discover. Playing this game knowing its limitations, it, it's just so impressive. To pull all of this off, the Leeds team collaborated with its Rockstar North co-workers to repurpose the new compression techniques that were being developed at the same time for San Andreas, trimming down essentially every asset and texture to its absolute bare minimum, and even having to organize all of the data onto the UMDs in specific configurations so that the game could stream the data in chunks rather than constantly. After all, you kind of want to limit how often the disc has to spin inside a handheld where the player is constantly moving their hands or risking dropping the entire system. Now, of course, there are some hiccups that came with how the game modified its loading and data streaming. Sometimes, actually pretty frequently sadly, the game loads you right from a cutscene into the game without any warning. Where the other GTA games might have a little scripted sequence showing enemies running into the area to fight you, or you getting into a vehicle before a driving section, here it just suddenly drops you right into gameplay, meaning that you can get punched in the face or shot at before you even have a chance to move. Given how good the enemy aiming is in this game, and how hard it is to maintain your health at times, that's it's not ideal. In particular, I want to shout out the audio compression, because while some lines do sound a bit more clearly canned than others, it's a testament to the technical wizardry that Rockstar Leeds was known for that they fit nearly 80 full songs onto the radio, totaling about six and a half hours of radio time when the talk radio station is included, on top of all the voiced dialogue for the rest of the game. They actually achieved this by setting each radio station, ads and commercials and all, as one compressed, looping 25 to 30 minute audio track rather than a more dynamic mix like in previous games, and they covered it up by cutting in some breaking news stingers that would sometimes interrupt to talk about story events. Now, although that means, for example, if you listen to the talk radio station, that you might hear Laszlo taking the same listener call a few times from some guy yelling about wanting to eat people, Rockstar really had a weird cannibalism thing going on around this time, but it, whatever the case, it's a smart solution that played into Leeds' compression strengths. There's a reason that Rockstar acquired this studio after seeing them get half an hour of Max Payne's actual voiceover onto a GBA cartridge. The American dream come true. Now, of course, you can obviously still very much tell at times that this is a PSP game that's based more on GTA 3 and Vice City than San Andreas. There's, for example, a good bit more pop-in than the PS2 games had, alongside some expectedly weak textures considering the game's supposed to run at a resolution of 480 by 272 Tony moves pretty stiff. I mean, look at his posture. Dude's asking for a lifetime of neck pain. But outside of some control compromises, this controls exactly like you would expect from GTA. In fact, it's arguably better Better in some aspects. All of the car models feel unique, fast and responsive, a great balance of the arcadey handbrake sliding you would want while still having weight to the cars. I actually got the urge to make this video after replaying Vice City's, again heavy air quote, definitive version, and realizing how rough that game's controls actually were, and going right from that game's slippery ice physics on every single vehicle to this one feeling exactly like you remember GTA feeling? Man. The fact that the vast majority of the time, Liberty City Stories is going to fool you into thinking this could be, and is, a home console experience is wild. I particularly love the fact that when you enter a safe house, you can still see and hear people walking, police sirens, cars, all that stuff outside, rather than boxing up the windows like they easily could have. It's that attention to detail that you don't even see on the console games. And the game's got a ton of new added features, too. It didn't skimp out on innovation. Aside from the six-player multiplayer, some of the new side missions include a trash collection collecting one in the vein of the taxi minigame, a car dealership mission where you have to drive customers around in specific ways to sell them on those cars. Some may want to feel how the car handles off-road, while others want you to actively run over pedestrians. A GTA game, this very clearly is. It had been a long time since I really felt GTA hit this level of variety, and I didn't even do many of the side missions during my playtime. Even in the main missions, there's a ton of it, stretching from lengthy gang wars, to defending your gang's illegal casino from truck bombers, to arming a car of your own and bombing them back, to walking into a church confessional booth and having the priest dare you to murder a bunch of federal witnesses for some reason. You know why they call me Die Hartman. Did you like it? 
to killing the mayor to rigging the next mayoral election to replace the mayor you killed. O'Donovan the communist! O'Donovan has three wives! And all of those, by the way, happen in the first few hours of the game, working to teach you the differences between each of the six wanted levels in a surprisingly organic fashion. It's the kind of thing that felt better done than really any prior GTA story. So many of these new little mechanics were introduced at a steady tick and early on to help LCS stand out from the three console games, while still standing firmly against them as an equal. It's not all perfect though, since we do run into many of the issues that you'd probably expect from a three-dimensional game on a system with only one analog stick. The biggest one LCS runs into is that there's no way to crouch, and with most guns, sort of like in San Andreas, there's no way to move while you are aiming and shooting at enemies, only in this case, there's no weapon experience system to grant you that ability later on. Although the HUD takes after San Andreas, the less precise aiming system from the prior games is here, so you can't just lock onto headshots, and the enemies happen to have better aim compared to the console titles too, just to kick you while you're down. So most gunfights end up with you standing around, holding down the fire button, taking a ton of free damage, and really hoping you won't die. There is also a free aim that helps a good bit since you can't move anyway with the guns that matter, although it's a bit unwieldy on the PSP version since you've got to be in range of an enemy to lock onto them in the first place, press down on the D-pad, and then move your hand back over to the PSP's analog stick to control the aim after that. Some missions compensate for this by giving you frequent health or armor pickups, but the game really goes its hardest with combat in the first couple hours while not letting you buy armor in the ammunition shops until much later on. The dominant strategy that I found was to get into a car and spray and pray using the iffy drive-by mechanics to your advantage. See, the game sort of aims for you when you're doing a drive-by now since you can't decide which direction to shoot out of your car, and I swear there's a huge damage buff to compensate for that lack of control, so you'll just shred enemies much, much faster while putting yourself at a much lower risk of dying and having to start from the very beginning of that mission all over again. At the very least, if nothing else, this is the earliest GTA to start leaning away from locking you into using one vehicle for entire missions, allowing you to swap out if one gets too damaged most of the time, instead of your allies just sitting in an exploding car and forcing you to again start over from the beginning of the mission. Not every mission gives you that freedom, but a lot more do than I recall in San Andreas or earlier. Since Rockstar felt that checkpoints weren't worth investing time into until about 2009, we just have to count ourselves lucky that many of LCS's missions end up on the shorter side to play into the whole portability aspect. While there's a really strong mission variety by GTA standards, they're usually not going to be as complex as some of the console game's missions, and for what it's worth, I think that works to this game's benefit since the missions end up being a bit shorter. Now, the story behind those missions... The story... the story doesn't, uh... It, it doesn't really matter at all, it's just an excuse to do a bunch of really stupid and mostly fun missions by way of a lengthy multi-family mafia war to get us up to the events of GTA 3. Like that whole kill the mayor thing, for example. You kill him because he's a plant for one of the rival families, and then you try to help recurring character and actual cannibal Donald Love win the ensuing election, only for him to lose and lose all of his money in the process. Same guy later makes you kill a few people, collect their bodies for consumption, and blow up an entire chunk of the city so that he can redevelop it under the Colombian cartel, these games are weird. For how ambitious this game attempts to be, the story overall really is just kinda small scale, and it can get a little bit unbalanced when it suddenly leaps into international chaos like the Colombian cartel, or fighting a mafia war against the Sicilian families back in the homeland, or what have you. A lot of it probably comes with this game being a forced prequel that answers questions that nobody really ever asked, as we'll see next with Vice City Stories as well. For example, a good chunk of this game ends up taking place on the first island, really just in a couple blocks of this city. At first, this is to clearly separate LCS in your mind from GTA 3 by exploring an area that wasn't quite as heavily utilized in the earlier game story. But then, as time goes on and you're doing more and more small odd jobs to build up trust with the head of the family, you really start to run into a lot of the trite mob story tropes, like the maid man, or the sudden execution of somebody the boss thinks is a rat, or the gimp costume, and you question why the plot isn't going anywhere, or why you're circling around the same quarter mile of map without progressing at all for a good third of the game. I I think I'm in the mood for some loving. And then, like four hours in, you get to Island 2, and it immediately jumps to the mayor's assassination, and the election, and doing crimes for a church priest who's actually a reporter trying to expose your crimes or something, to also roping the Yakuza into the story because they're also in 3, and so they definitely also need to be ever so barely touched on here for some reason. Uh, 
If you're a weirdo like me that kinda likes playing these games for their stories, you'll probably end up a bit disappointed overall, because the A to B to C doesn't really click, and even in the context of GTA 3's story, a lot of it feels unnecessary, like kinda fluffy. As a small stakes, isolated mob war story, I like a good bit of what it did. There is something novel about seeing that San Andreas gang war sort of vibe featured more heavily throughout the game rather than just for the first 15 or so missions, but then the game develops into wiping out random characters from Vice City because there needs to be a way to rope the cartel into the mix. There are so many characters that are introduced solely for the sake of being killed off to motivate other characters three years later in GTA 3, like the leader of the Yakuza and his wife who hates him and asks Tony to kill him before she then jumps out of a window. If this game had been planned from the start of 3, a lot of these narrative ties could work. GTA 4's three-pronged story kinda showed that, but in practice, most of this game's cast gets essentially no fleshing out because they show up for a couple missions, if that. Now, despite that, I was very quickly in turn my brain off and enjoy the ride mode, maybe because Vice City had taught me not to pay attention to these stories. Because man, if you haven't played Vice City in a while, that game's story is, is trash. And if you don't really question the story at all, you're gonna have a really great time, if one that maybe starts to overstay its welcome a bit by the end, as things continue to go further off the rails. It ends up feeling, fittingly, like a mishmash between the first two 3D games and San Andreas. It's got a surprising number of San Andreas' mechanical improvements, particularly to the vehicle physics, but then it falls back into some of the weaker design elements of the earlier games, or some of the more paint-by-numbers missions and story beats that aren't really motivated or fleshed out ever as much as this is something from the writer's favorite crime shows or movies, but with some more fart or sex jokes. It's the kind of game that you look at today as more of a technical achievement than a stellar game that stands up to the acclaim of the first three 3D games, and really that's how it reviewed at the time as well. Which brings us to the second of the two GTA Stories games, 2006's Vice City Stories, a game that's even more ambitious and, honestly, much more fun than its predecessor, that crumbles on that technical level due to its ambition and due to its weaker foundation. For example, despite the game having a stronger and more consistent draw distance than LCS, because the skies of Vice City have always been so much more open due to a comparative lack of skyscrapers, it leads to almost no cars or pedestrians ever being on the road. The PSP just can't handle doing both at once. And yet, despite being arguably too powerful a game for the PSP, this rightfully feels like the culmination of everything in this 3D era of GTA games, so much so that it's a shame that this is the only modern GTA completely delisted due to music licensing, because it's one you absolutely should experience for yourself. This is the game that Vice City wanted to be, but couldn't deliver thanks to that game being so rushed. It evolves so many older features that it would make even San Andreas blush that wasn't meant to rhyme. And for the first proper time in GTA, you can finally truly build that underground empire to constantly keep your wallet happy and refilled. Or, 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 one more, for the first time in the GTA series, thank the merciful gods, if you get busted or die, you can pay a bit of money to keep all of your weapons and gear. And, I mean, let's be real, we've all been there. Not the, not the dead or uh, arrested part, hopefully, but a crappy fender bender or a sudden medical expense can completely upend you if you don't have the cash to handle it till payday. Now, when you really need it, today's sponsor, Dave.com, can help get you out of a pinch. If you're not familiar, Dave is a banking platform that can help you get up to $500 instantly with extra cash. That might mean more money to fill your tank, catch up on bills, finally get that check engine light looked at. It's a way to get a breather, and especially nowadays, as more people are working with a less consistent pay schedule, Dave offers a great helping hand with no interest, no late fees, and no credit check. Like, I, I know YouTubers don't like to talk about this stuff too much, but most of us really only get one paycheck a month, and it's near the end of the month because of how Google does things, so I've always got to keep diligent nowadays, and it's a genuine relief knowing that a crew like Dave exists if something suddenly came up. Millions of folks have already downloaded the Dave app to get the financial relief that they need with extra cash, so make sure to join those people and give yourself an extra hand by going to dave.com slash golden. That's a nice URL. Wow. Once again, that's dave.com slash golden. Sign up for an extra cash account and receive up to $500 instantly. For terms and conditions, go to dave.com slash legal. Instant transfer fees apply. Banking services provided by Evolve, member FDIC. Thanks once again to Dave for sponsoring this segment, and now, let's head back to Vice City. 
Vice City Stories, in its purest form, is cut from the same cloth as LCS before it, a Rockstar Leeds-developed PSP prequel starring a minor character from the PS2 original, which attempts to utilize the areas of each game's respective city that went a bit more ignored in the predecessor. I'm sure that's not a surprise, just as I'm sure it's not a surprise that LCS and VCS are the number one and two best-selling PSP games ever. Both games are impressive on a technical level, but the leap from LCS to this one is just insane, comparable to the jump from Vice City to San Andreas before it. The character models look so much better, with improved mouth-flapping animations during cutscenes, characters have actual fingers instead of giant mittens, the animation and gameplay feels so much more fluid. Things like bicycles make their return from San Andreas, and the vehicle control is another leap forward from LCS's already solid to great handling. This feels just about as close to perfect as San Andreas's handling did at the time, for what these games were aiming to be. Hell, this game even has the most substantial hand-to-hand -hand combat system in the series up to this point, and maybe even up through GTA 4, depending on your taste. Including the ability to grab enemies, throw them down to the ground, mount them for some grounded punches, or something I totally missed through my entire playthrough of the game because it's never really useful, you can stealthily sneak up behind somebody and just snap their neck while grabbing them, which is, uh... It genuinely comes off to me like the Leeds team knew going in that there was absolutely zero chance they would ever get to do a San Andreas Stories or even just a Los Santos Stories because of the PSP's hardware limitations. And so here, they went all in on making this a San Andreas sequel in all but name. I mean, for one, one of the first missions you do has you moving boxes with a forklift while under pressure. That's straight out of San Andreas, although this time you're not pressured by enemy fire, but an actual fire. Vice City Stories has more interiors than San Andreas had, which is saying a lot since that game had that whole house robbery side mission set with a bunch of unique house layouts. For this PSP game to have added more, it's just, again, insane. A fundamental part of VCS is an evolution of that game's gang war territory thing that San Andreas had going on, except here, you're building your own underground business empire by sieging 30 entire building sites across the city's two islands from rival gangs. You're building them up from a selection of six different business types, each with a small, medium, or large tier that'll generate different amounts of money. Each building has its own exterior and interior for every permutation therein, so a loan shark building will look different from a protection rack and a small loan shark building looks a lot different than a big loan shark building. Although you could purchase income-generating properties a couple times in the earlier games, and a good bit more in San Andreas, this combination of that game's investment and gang war systems is night and day, all the way down to you automatically getting paid at 4pm each day rather than having to run around to each property on the map to collect manually, which was never really worth doing with how low the income caps would be, so let's be real here, we were all just going to use the money cheat anyway. Here, you don't really have to. Each of your properties has a few different states of damage that it'll show visually if you let it get attacked by rival gangs, to show that it's a less effective moneymaker now than if it was at full health. And in addition to housing members of your gang inside that you can recruit and bring along with you throughout the city, just like in San Andreas, all six of the business types have their own set of dynamic missions that'll increase your potential earnings from that type of business should you complete those missions. Think like a much more involved version of the Vigilante or Ambulance or Firefighter or Taxi missions throughout all of these games, except that these ones save your progress, so you don't need to do all 6 or 15 missions in one go for that particular business type. This, like I said earlier, is the game that Vice City wanted to be. You build a crime empire as a substantial and congruent side section of the game, rather than just through a handful of missions that suddenly tell you that you're the king of fake Miami. As a result, the mission variety is right up there with a San Andreas, albeit with a more challenging slant since both of the stories games were designed to target GTA fans specifically rather than just the general audience, and so the teams were willing to push the difficulty a bit and experiment more. Would have been cool if they, I don't know, experimented with checkpoints maybe, but like San Andreas before, this game at least has the trip skip feature if you fail a mission or die or get busted during one, so that you don't have to drive all the way back to the start of the mission. 
Vice City Stories is, in many ways, the ultimate classic 3D GTA experience, the culmination of every prior game's ideas thrown in with marked improvements, incredible quality of life features, like that ability to bribe back your weapons after getting wasted or busted. God, this game's hidden package equivalent, in addition to being 99 red balloons, which is just cute, they have an option to automatically mark on the map which one of those balloons you've gotten, rather than force completionists to just run around the world slowly with a guide looking for that pesky last one. Even later games didn't do that. Outside of some of those performance issues I mentioned earlier, a choppier frame rate at times, especially in the main Vice City Island, the one that you start in in Vice City, but the second one you get to here, and outside of some annoying hiccups like you for some reason taking a lot of damage to your actual health or armor when you're in a vehicle, which traditionally in these games meant the car would take damage rather than you, it's a little weird, there are very few negatives besides those to Vice City Stories gameplay. It's almost a crime that this is the only game in the modern series that's not playable on any platforms or even available on phones due to licensing issues, because it is the hidden swan song for this era of Grand Theft Auto prior to its move to HD. Now, for all of my gushing there, there is a catch. The font really sucks, and it's hard to read when you change radio stations. No, but sadly, the other thing that carried over from LCS is that this is a prequel, narratively speaking, that nobody really asked for, that wasn't exactly planned for, and that doesn't really feel like it justifies its existence as a satisfying addition to the greater GTA narrative from this 3D universe era. See, in Vice City Stories, you play as Victor Vance, the older brother of Vice City's most annoying character and the ultimate villain of that game, Lance Vance. You may remember Victor from Vice City's intro, where he looked completely different and is killed in the opening cutscene of the game with absolutely zero fanfare. Yeah, so that's already the big problem here. Unlike in Liberty City Stories, we know specifically what happens to this character at the beginning of the game, and we know that whatever we're doing now doesn't really matter in the grand scheme. Vice City Stories takes place two years before Vice City proper, and through the course of the story, you'll establish a pretty strong stranglehold over the entirety of the city's underworld. Like, a stronger one than you even have by the end of Vice City, the game that you're supposed to be building an empire in. I feel like if you count out all of the buildings in this game's map, Victor is using like 10% of this entire city as a crime front by the end of the game, only to never be acknowledged two years later in universe. It ends up feeling a bit hollow when you know that all of this work that you've put in is never even hinted at in Vice City because the Vance crime family up and disappears sometime after this game. In universe, it's because Victor chose to leave well enough alone, seemingly, but because Vice City came first, there's no real hole for Vice City stories to fill, instead having the game very messily carve out its own plot, inconsistencies be damned. Let's go back to the start, though. Vice City Stories starts Victor off at the Fort Baxter Air Force Base as an army recruit looking to make a good living so that he can help take care of his little brother Pete, who's got asthma and has racked up a bunch of medical bills that his sweet aunt can't afford. It's one of the more noble GTA protagonist backstories, which of course means that his commanding officer Martinez is a corrupt drug pusher who forces Vic to do his illegal bidding. Within maybe five or six missions, Victor's caught by another superior with the smuggled drugs and the stripper that Martinez asked him to pick up, and Vic is kicked out of the army, again, maybe three to five missions into the game. From there, he works with series regular side character Phil Cassidy, the ex-military arms dealer voiced by a very clearly out-of-it Gary Busey. Phil, don't open the... Daddy! before being sent by Phil to help his brother-in-law Marty, the leader of a racist gang of trailer park boys. Quick aside, by the way, this game handled the GTA series' recurring cell phone struggle the best up until this point. In every prior game, up until 4, you would only be able to receive cell phone calls while on foot, meaning that you would often have to stop what you're doing to let a slow conversation play out and lead you to the next mission. But thankfully, this time around, you just have a little military-supplied pager, so you'll see the text pop up no matter if you're driving or on foot, it'll just be in the corner of your screen. And... That's kind of fitting, actually, because although Victor is never short to respond, his character is pretty inconsistent from very early on, and so having these messages be sent to you one way without you having a verbal response to them probably helps stop him from his somewhat intended but poorly executed flip-flopping. 
Throughout this first act of the game, there's an attempt at Victor coming off as this well-intentioned guy that's pulled unwillingly into the cycle of crime, before slowly molding into a worse and worse man because of the nature of his job and his growing power. Early on, to be fair, it's written in such a way that Vic is just kind of boring, but there are nuggets of greatness here that just never get mined or capitalized on. Vic will frequently talk about how he doesn't want to do this, whatever this is in that mission in particular. A character like Marty is just designed to be comically evil, racist, abusive father, wife-beating scum, so that Vic's quickly justified in forming a connection with Marty's wife, Louise, another well-intentioned character who just ends up trapped in life by that vicious cycle of violence and crime. And so that when Marty tries to take his abuse on her too far, Vic is justified in killing him. However, then from there, they quickly drop Luis from the plot for most of the rest of the game, even though she's shaping up to be this major character, even though at first she's acting as essentially the manager for Vic's empire, the proper tutorial into that empire-building side game, which amounts to a good several hours of this game's runtime. They had something so interesting there, two characters that have this parallel to them that brings them together, hell, all the way down to Luis's daughter ending up having to be raised by her aunt just like the Vance boys were. But just like that army plot point you've already forgot existed, even though I only mentioned it like two minutes ago, this story can't juggle all that it tries to do and it ends up on softer, shakier ground than the inundated Miami bedrock. Most of that comes down to the story killer that is Lance Vance, Vic's psychologically damaged little brother who suddenly shows up to cause trouble at the exact time that Luis and the other characters from the start of the game start to disappear. Lance flies in at the airport and immediately gets his brother deep into the drug dealing game, forming partnerships with other seedy criminals only to immediately say he doesn't trust them and try to betray them, causing Vic even more headache with every passing mission and every passing I don't trust this man, which is, I swear to God, every three missions in this game. See, if you're not familiar, Lance's biggest character trait in both of the Vice City games is that he is paranoid as a plot point. Almost every single time that he partners up with somebody in either game, Lance, within moments, starts to question them and insist that they are plotting against them, a trait that only gets exacerbated by him using his own product. In this game, it's in the form of him introducing Vic to Crime Lord after Crime Lord, saying that they would be a great team, Victor being skeptical and asking if they can really trust this person, Lance saying, yeah, absolutely, only for genuinely one mission later, Lance to say, actually, no, we can't trust this new partner, they're conspiring against me, Vic, you have to kill them. It's transparently this retroactive way of justifying how inconsistent Lance's writing is in Vice City, due in part to that game being so rushed and having so much of its story told by way of cell phone calls, which if you remember what I said earlier, you can just miss if you aren't on foot all the time. But instead of giving a deeper motive behind the dude's paranoia, they just kind of go all in on him being batshit insane in a weird haha funny way most of the time, which turns the story into a bumbling brother hijinks plot for most of the middle act, with random cameos from characters from Vice City to remind you that this is in fact a prequel. Oh, and also, Phil Collins. There's just an entire mission randomly tossed into this game where you defend a real Phil Collins concert from Sabotage because Phil's agent wronged the cartel. Kinda surreal, and this makes Phil Collins, fun fact, the first celebrity to appear in GTA as themselves. Anyway, I could go deeper into Vice City Stories plot mission by mission because there really are a lot of fascinating threads that sort of just get frayed rather than tugged on, but the short of it is that Victor, from the moment Lance shows up, starts bouncing back and forth between hardening criminal and that good guy in a bad spot that he was at the start of the game, only not in a way that shows internal conflict as much as poor writing consistency as it juggles two different sorts of plot before hastily looping them back together by the end. He'll meet Danny Trejo's character and pull a gun on the dude the moment that he's insulted, only to bounce right back into his normal self immediately afterwards. We'll get some moments that unveil so much about Victor's relationship with his brother, such as their mother showing up partway through the game, and us seeing why they were raised by their aunt as children, because the mother also struggled with addiction. And those moments inform further moments, like Victor snapping at Luis later in the game when she suddenly shows back up for no reason, doing drugs with Lance. He's a dude upset set at his sort of partner because he sees the cycle starting to repeat and he doesn't want Luis's daughter to be another victim of that cycle. 
only, we hadn't seen Luis for the prior half of the game by this point, and so the writing just has to pretend that their relationship was there and building, when in practice, it was not there and not building. And that'll just be interspersed between her being kidnapped two different times, or Victor filming a zombie movie in a mall, or remotely controlling a giant sentient Nintendo Rob robot, or fighting an army of bikini-clad women who are actually undercover cartel agents holding AK-47s. Oh, and now, by the way, I'm in file 10 of my 11 gameplay recording files, and suddenly Victor finally shares that he has feelings for Luis when she appears for the first time since file 4. Then, all of the characters from the start of the game return to help Victor for a few missions out of nowhere, really, and then Luis gets kidnapped and Lance instead gets mad about his car having a scratch on it, and then Luis dies and Lance talks shit about her to her partner, his brother, immediately afterwards. And that's played more as a joke than a mask-off moment showing how messed up this dude is. It's just frustrating, because while Victor, due to his dialogue and voice acting, can come off as a kind of bland character compared to other GTA protagonists, he's also probably got the most good in him. You can see what they attempt to do with his moral struggle, but you can find a way to root for Vic by the end of the game, when he's this one-man army taking down an entire office building full of troops to exact revenge on his former commanding officer and the cartel he's aligned with, the same commanding officer and cartel that just killed his girlfriend not long before that. Seriously, that final mission is one of the better ones in the series. There's something magical and super satisfying about fighting an attack helicopter while bouncing around between different shelves and doorways using them as cover while you work your way up several floors of a skyscraper. Oh, and then also by the end, Lance shows up ready to help, but you've already done everything. That's emblematic of everything about this game. This game is all over the place with its story, in part because they have to establish a completely new cartel to take down since we know which cartels already appear in Vice City to begin with. And even more than that, the writing serves more to give more Lance hijinks rather than pay off the more interesting stories that they were starting to tell here. And then for Vic to be killed off as essentially a nameless goon in Vice City's opening, for none of this game's story to really have an impact on that game's plot, it leaves a sour taste. Where Liberty City Stories adds texture, even if nobody necessarily asked for that texture, this one narratively never justifies its existence except to highlight that some of Rockstar's producers must have really liked Lance and wanted him back to do more wacky crazy things. Vice City Stories is a high point for the 3D era of GTA to end on in terms of gameplay, again, excluding some of those performance issues, and I guess if you're looking for the traditional boot up GTA and run from the cops gameplay, this probably isn't the right GTA for you, since generally fast-paced driving down Vice City's, like, I don't know, two roads means that you're probably going to outpace the PSP's limited vehicle spawning capabilities. But if you're looking for mission variety or any other facet of gameplay, this is the high point, and yet it's kind of a low point narratively. Still completely worth playing, though. I mean, you get to bring an explosive pinata to a rival warehouse and watch it destroy an entire building somehow. 10 out of 10. Now, there is one more PSP Grand Theft Auto game to touch on, although it was exclusive to the Nintendo DS for half a year first. That would be 2009's Grand Theft Auto Chinatown Wars, the second game in what's often referred to as the HD era of the series' universe, since GTA 4 marked a bit of a clean break from that 3D universe's stories and characters. Like I mentioned at the top of the video, Chinatown Wars is the highest rated DS game of all time. Honestly, probably in part due to GTA having that golden child air around it at this time, where everybody was so caught up in a lot of the hype and prestige, and daring to give GTA a critical score would have gotten you death threats on the same level as daring to criticize Zelda. But it's also, fun fact, the second highest rated PSP game of all time too, only barely falling behind God of War Chains of Olympus. This is the sort of GTA game we'll almost certainly never see again. Obviously, the side and even mainline games in general have fallen by the wayside in recent years since they can make a lot more money selling you in-game money and adding more missions to GTA Online. Wonderful, but can you imagine Rockstar greenlighting a top-down Nintendo game that harkens back to the original 2D GTA games while also being directly placed into the world and narrative of a game like GTA 4 just because? 
On some level, you can't even really tell who the target audience is here, because odds are most people playing GTA 4 on their Xbox or PS3 aren't gonna pick up a DS game, and it showed. Chinatown Wars, by all indications, is the worst-selling Grand Theft Auto game outside of one of actually one of the other Nintendo GTA games that we'll be talking about shortly. Really, what this game comes off as is one massive flex between interviews at the time sharing that the game had over 800,000 lines of code, more than San Andreas they'll have you know, or breakdowns of the game's genuinely impressive GPS feature, functioning identically to GTA 4's and highlighting the best legal traffic route to your objective or marker like every GTA game and really every Rockstar game has done since GTA 4, or the full set of radio stations featuring instrumental tracks composed by Dead Mouse, among others. It was 2009, after all. Or just the fact that this game has a one-to-one -one recreation of GTA 4's map, with the exception of the Third Island. It was New Jersey anyway, so not much was lost. In fact, the game is such a tech showcase that they forgot to make it very fun. Yeah, so this was kind of disappointing. I remembered my time with Chinatown Wars very fondly. In particular, the fun sub-game where you could trade different drugs in a fluctuating economy. One area might have been selling a particular product low and buying another one high due to demand there. And it was fun being able to quickly earn absurd amounts of money in these games without entering cheat codes. Another way to better memorize parts of the map based on which buyers and sellers were on which street corners. It added to the usual loop of driving to and from missions even if very quickly you might just start taking taxis instead to skip the travel. Now, should adolescents have been encouraged to deal drugs on their DSs? No, of course not, but the PictoChat cartels are a story for another day. Here, this was harmless fun in the same way that it was really cool having to hotwire different models of car via touchscreen minigames, steal radios from the inside of those cars with similar minigames, or fill up Molotovs at a gas station using the worst gas pump you've ever seen in your life. I have little flashbulb memories of running from a wanted level and having to quickly do the hijack minigame, that little bit of stress building up knowing that there were cops right on my tail about to open the door and bust me, and that sort of thing enhanced the experience in a way that GTA had never been able to pull off before. Since I played the DS1 years and years ago, I went with the PSP one this time around, both to see some of the differences and because I figured the footage would be a bit cleaner for you guys to watch. The main changes here are that the touchscreen minigame controls are swapped out with traditional button controls, and that they added a few story missions that are honestly nothing to write home about. If anything, they made me like the game less, uh, because it, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get there. Coming back to this game this time around, I realized that all of those cool little moments in this story of betrayal and revenge and triad gang wars, they're all cool moments because they're one-off moments, they're spots or they're set pieces. The game never really stops being a tutorial for something more involved that sadly never manifests. Throughout this game, there'll be missions that teach you how to do all of the different touchscreen minigames. They'll introduce you to the weird top-down sniper controls. They'll put you in a helicopter or in a Chinese New Year dragon costume where you have to move like a parade float would to not draw attention to the fact that you and your allies are wanted for a huge heist you just pulled at a bank to a minigame where you have to tattoo new recruits to your gang as part of their initiation, or a mission where you have to kidnap and drive a guy who's having constant heart attacks in the back of an ambulance and you've got to keep trying to revive him while also escaping police, which is kind of cool, only for that mission to end with your boss ripping the guy's heart out anyway as revenge. Wonderful. Every single one of these things may only be used once or twice before they move on to the next shiny object to teach you how to do once or twice before moving on again. It's also a game, I realized having 100% completed GTA 4 back around when this game came out, but having not played GTA 4 in the decade and a half since, that relies on your knowledge of GTA 4's Liberty City from the expectation that you played that game, because the missions just jerk you around from point to point to point without ever really settling on recognizable areas for more than a couple missions at a time. Where both stories games maybe spent too long in a few previously underutilized areas as a way of distinguishing wishing them from the earlier uses of those cities, this one is best played as an addendum to GTA 4 so that you can explore the map from a new top-down perspective. Without that, it's just kind of a bland city. The GPS feature helps and hurts that, since you can pay less attention and just follow markers both on the map or even overlaid onto the roads themselves. And since this was a DS game first, there's already an optional lane correction feature so that you don't need to use a D-pad for precise driving controls on such a small screen. That just all has the added side effect of meaning you spend a little bit less time paying attention to the roads and thus learning the area. 
for this game to piggyback off of your GTA 4 knowledge ends up being a huge disappointment because this game has so many neat small scale innovations to attempt to make it feel more lived in and kind of more small scale than your usual GTA story. There are proper toll booths now that'll make you slow down or risk a wanted level if you speed by and don't pay the toll. The ammunition weapon vendor is back after disappearing in 4, but this time around they're an online store so you'll see delivery trucks driving around that you can try to rob. Since you use gas stations to fill up molotovs, or you can find weapons in red dumpsters, or some shops let you walk in and play a variety of scratch-off lotto tickets just because. Those are actually really funny, by the way, since they act as the restaurants of old. One of the scratch-offs gives you a burger and fries, so it's just a food battle pass. Anyway, because of all of these slices of life crammed into the city, it behooves you to pay attention to the little things, but since the story never sits you in one spot for all that long, none of it really sticks the landing in terms of making the city itself or its many landmarks all that recognizable top down, and that's one of the most important parts of a GTA game. Most notably, there is such a cool innovation to the wanted level chase format that would benefit so greatly from you having enough time throughout the story to get familiar with shortcuts and back roads and main roads. As your wanted level increases, you'll see more of these police car icons on your HUD. In Chinatown Wars, you can disable police vehicles by ramming them and damaging them enough to make sure they don't run anymore, obviously. And by taking out the required number of cars, you can lower your wanted level organically and make it easier to escape the now thinned out pursuit. It is so, so, so fun a system, and with how slippery and sometimes almost micro-machines-esque the driving controls can feel, it helps drive an extra bit of chaos. But what really stands out to me the most with this game's struggles is that because Chinatown Wars can't rely on bystander dialogue or the radio ads and spoofs of contemporary media to help get you in that snarky, cynical mindset, it has to pack all of its cynicism and self-aware edginess into either the emails you get by way of your smartphone, most of which are story-related but occasionally spam messages will pop up, or the edge will instead be packed into the story's still-frame cutscenes. And it's... it's bad. Putting aside all of the constant and immediate use of edgy buzzwords and insults, whether they be kind of racist or sexist or absurdly ableist, this might be the most poorly aged GTA edge you can find, putting that aside, our protagonist Huang Li quickly and frequently responds to comments with quips about how he's a murdering drug peddler. Everybody's gotta have a one-liner in response to insults. One of the final lines in this game is one character commenting, your dialogue is weak and uninspired. Why is that here? Pretty much every character in the story is irredeemable, and not in the kind of funny way, just in the frustrating, I don't even want to do missions for you way to try and grind at you like they grind at Huang. Even in the rare instance where it's actually kind of funny, like somebody telling Huang's Uncle Wu, who goes by Kenny, that Kenny is a stupid name, the writing cannot get out of its own way. When it's not offensive, it tries too hard to be quippy. When it's not quippy, it's some poorly written seg like, meanwhile, my father remains dead as a transition. The main focus of the Chinatown Wars plot is on Huang looking for the person that had his father killed. He arrives in Liberty City to deliver a ceremonial sword to his uncle Wu slash Kenny, as the sword determines who will be the successor of the city's triad groups for some reason. When he's shot in the head and left for dead upon arrival with the sword stolen from him, Huang works with Kenny to try and retrieve the sword while looking for answers. Very quickly, this unravels into a three-way power struggle for the title of successor between Kenny, the current head son, and that same leader's top lieutenant, both of whom Huang also has to work for, despite them being just as insufferable as his uncle. Huang becomes an unwilling police informant when he's caught by the token corrupt GTA detective who's still trying to do some good, and then he also becomes an informant for the triad leader who suspects there's a coup attempt going on. It's a whole mess of a story featuring double and triple crosses, ultimately resulting in Huang's Uncle Kenny making him kill the other two in the power struggle because Kenny somehow planted fake files in the FBI, or in this game's case FIB, incriminating the other two as police informants, only for Huang to find out that Kenny's master plan involved killing Huang dad and stealing the sword as part of this whole power play while running a separate shadow gang that was helping muddy the waters further? And then when Huang kills his uncle as revenge, and the cops show up and watch him kill a dude, that corrupt detective, who's kind of already on the run from the other cops, shows up and orders those cops to let Huang go because he's a good kid, even though they just watched him commit several felonies. Uh, to, to quote this game's recap for the final mission of the game, I think I won. 
It just feels like I lost, and I didn't get laid. This city sucks. That That's that's pretty accurate for how this game feels at the end, honestly. Sidebar, pretty cool that they let you replay missions now. Still, no checkpoints, but if you fail, they do just let you restart right then and there with a menu pop-up instead of driving back to the mission marker. Oh yeah, and also, this whole ceremonial sword thing, his dad won that sword in a game of poker, just to further undercut the entire story. The game is full of cool moments, and honestly, I still find it really fun to play, but the connective tissue is, frankly, just kind of bad. I mean, for one, I haven't commented yet on these cutscene images. What... <laughs> What are these? Every time I got to the cutscenes, maybe this is the intent, I don't know, I was too busy laughing at the really bad pictures than paying as much attention to the dialogue underneath as I maybe could have. Huang 100% of the time is just mouth breathing in response to any and everything, even watching the early love interest character bleeding out in front of him, he just looks like a doofus. Oh yeah, here's another thing that my brain completely reconstructed, by the way. I remembered that this character Ling died in the story, I didn't realize they killed her off in Mission 2. It's a weird misdirect after having her featured so prominently in the marketing images, having her be the tutorial for how the game handles gunplay, or rummaging through those specially marked red dumpsters for guns hidden by their gang, and then suddenly she's killed off in the end of that very same mission. Even those mission replay descriptions try to play up Huang liking her, like, he says he had a lot of fun with her and, and that he misses her, but she's only in two consecutive missions, totaling maybe ten minutes before getting killed off. She was really the only character that felt like she wasn't just a complete jerk too, Huang included, so the game just loses its humanity immediately. Those PSP bonus missions bring in one of the leader's girlfriends who's a TV reporter, and she's just as insufferable, making you commit crimes so that she can film them, and adding essentially nothing to the story other than another annoying body to bury and another reason to dislike her boyfriend as he continues giving you missions later on in the game. Also, like in GTA 4, there are a number of random stranger side missions you can find on the map, this time around more frequently featuring recurring characters so that you can get to learn a bit of their story. Honestly, these are maybe the highlight of the game writing-wise. They'll go from funny, like a hot dog vendor asking you to tail his wife because he's convinced she's cheating on him only for Hot Dog Man to find out she's actually working the streets and then pay her because he really wants to get laid, Actually, I was gonna say they go from funny stuff like that to kind of sad or touching, but I'm looking back at my notes and I'm realizing that the sad and touching ones are just as cynical as the rest of the main story stuff, so uh, never mind. There's a lady who wants you to drive her around really fast and do a bunch of stunts because she finds out she only has a month to live and she wants to live a bit, followed later by you driving her to her lawyer's office because she was misdiagnosed and now she wants to sue for stress and uh, harm done, and then she gets hit by a car immediately after getting out at the end of that mission because she was uh, getting insufferable like the rest of the cast, so that's, I guess that's cool. Another one is a dude buying up a ton of property only to jump off a bridge when he gets hit by a bunch of foreclosures and can't even find the keys to the only house he had left, a and then you find the keys, he had just, he had dropped them right nearby by accident, and you take his house. The game can pull some cheap dark laughs like that every now and then, but I'm sad to say that a lot of the substance of the game just isn't there in retrospect like I thought it was. The only reason that they kill that Ling character off is because there are two bonus missions that were tied to Rockstar Social Club integration back in the day. You would have to link your account, then find two hidden lion statues somewhere in the city at one of these blue swirlies that the game never explains to you otherwise, so you just see these blue swirlies and think they're a thing, but they're, but they're just they're just not, and then you get two bonus missions featuring Ling's brother who wants to get revenge, and also ends up dying in nearly the exact same spot that she did. You never really get a win here, it's just constant yes but. The main story's a spot fest, and while I find the gameplay itself, again, really fun because of all those little things they added in, because of how different it makes itself and how much it can stand out thanks to all of that unique texture, the missions never hit second gear even though there's a constantly rotating carousel of variety to them, and combined with just plain poor writing, it's harder to get through than I ever would have remembered. I clearly play these games for more than just their mission variety though, I'm in the minority where I also like a decent, if campy, story to help make it all worthwhile. If you're just trying to find a weird but fun GTA game, this is a different flavor that's honestly still cool to check out, just it, it did not age well, so I uh, look forward to that. Also, the game's main theme was composed by Ghostface Killa and MF Doom. That's I didn't know where else to put that, so enjoy that knowledge. 
And speaking of things I couldn't really put anywhere else, there are three Game Boy GTA games, two on Game Boy Color and one on Advance, and this last part's gonna go by pretty quickly because there's, there's not, not very much to say here. Both of the GBC games are insanely impressive in the fact that they even exist whatsoever, because they straight up take the maps of the proper Grand Theft Autos 1 and 2 and plant them onto a tiny screen with few to no compromises outside of visual fidelity and coloring, of course. The first one is actually a regular Game Boy compatible game too, which means that it's Super Game Boy compatible, and that means that this Game Boy port of a PS1 game is playable on the Super Nintendo, and I just, I find that cool. If you've never played the first two GTA games before, they're obviously very different from what you'd come to expect by now. Generally, your missions are going to come by way of random phone booths that are ringing throughout the cities, and you just kind of have to find one and, and hope hope you find one, actually, and then that'll set you on a quest line to steal cars or take down specific targets, rinse and repeat as the story progresses, and that's it. As far as these GBC versions go, though, oh man. It's wild that they got the game to work on a system that only has two face buttons and start and select, but GTA 1, as a result, probably not a surprise, blows to play. The A button is your move forward button, with the D-pad instead functioning as left or right tank controls, only the controls are relative to the character's orientation and not the screen, which doesn't rotate. With this as your character sprite, no matter which protagonist you select when you start the game, it's really hard to tell which way you are looking forwards versus backwards, and in a game where you die in one single hit, you can imagine how fun that struggle would be. Up on the D-pad does nothing, by the way, so you could have just had regular movement controls, and it would have worked fine. But, but, nope. To enter vehicles, you need to press Select and A at the same time, where Select is your weapon cycling button otherwise. There's no map to pull up here either, so you've got to try and memorize the road layouts, good luck in a world that's so insanely empty, that I'm not even sure you can get the cops to chase you for anything. I, I tried. The way characters work in GTA 1 here is that they are essentially save files, except there's not really a save system. You get an autosave once you've completed one of the game's cities in full, but if you press start and then B to exit to the main menu, you'll be starting over from scratch otherwise. It's also very easy to accidentally do that, so... That's also great. Because the screen's view is so small, at one point I accidentally drove over a bridge that's under construction and fell to my death. The screen shakes when you move diagonally, cars can easily get stuck in corners which may as well render them unusable, and while each car has its own radio tune rather than there being a radio, all the cars control pretty close to the same, with instant acceleration and jerky controls, again probably as you'd expect. Now that all said, in GTA 2 it is night and day, with vehicle momentum and acceleration that feels normal. The turning is smoother, the health's a bit improved thankfully, but as a trade-off to that and the very improved visuals and all the more populated cities, the game runs worse, and for some reason, you can get your car stuck on other cars similar to how you could get them stuck on walls in GTA 1. You can't, you can't kick into reverse or push those cars out of the way, once you've stopped you don't have the horsepower for that, so you're just screwed once again at that point. And for some reason in this version, if you do have the cops chasing you, they can never pull you out of your vehicle, but if they even touch you at all by a single pixel while you're on foot, it's instant game over. GTA 2 has always been an interesting experiment no matter the version, because this game puts you in a handful of real-world cities rather than the fictional ones that we're now used to, and in each area there are three different gangs controlling their own turf. Each gang will give you different missions to progress the story, and those missions also affect your reputation between all of the different gangs. So sometimes you might have one specific group hostile towards you that'll try and fight you on site in one part of town simply because you went to another area first and did a rival gang's mission that put you at odds with the now hostile group. One of these days, I'll finally sit down and beat the first two GTA games instead of just bumbling around for an hour and then putting them down, but these versions are absolutely not how I'm going to do it, as much as you've got to respect that these exist at all. Thankfully, we're not ending the video on a downer. Good job, me, because GTA Advance exists. Released on the very same day as San Andreas in October 2004, this game is the first prequel to GTA 3, although it takes place after Liberty City Stories, which makes that game technically a prequel to a prequel. That said, it doesn't really have a lot narratively to do with GTA 3, it doesn't really set up too much or move 3's plot into motion with one exception, it's sort of just another game set in a version of GTA 3's Liberty City that happens to feature a handful of characters like 8-Ball or Asuka, the leader of the Yakuza, by this point in the timeline, after her parents died in LCS. 
The only real plot thread connecting this to the other two Liberty City games from this era is that the end sequence leads to 8-Ball getting arrested, which in turn eventually leads to his prison break with Claude that starts GTA 3. Early plans for this game actually began right upon the GBA's launch, with Rockstar originally passing the title off to another studio for production and publishing before GTA 3 completely changed the gaming world, at which point they took back the rights so that they could have a more direct hand in controlling the game and its quality. Starting in late 2001, this version of GTA Advance was developed by outside studio Crawfish Interactive. The original announcement for this game was that GTA Advance would be an ambitious port of GTA 3 rather than a new game, but this shifted away from that over time when it became pretty clear that some parts of the city would need to be completely reconstructed to manage a new top-down perspective. For example, despite having functionally the same map, due to the differences in scale between a third-person game and a top-down game, and what that means for playability and movement speed, GTA Advance is technically three times bigger than GTA 3. It also didn't help that Crawfish shut down during production, leading to a lengthy delay for this game and a shift to Digital Eclipse handling development. By the time GTA Advance released, the DS was only weeks away from launching, and the exceptionally short window that was the GBA's lifespan had closed, leading to this being the worst-selling original GTA of all time. I'm assuming the Game Boy ports of 1 and 2 fared a bit worse sales-wise when we count ports, but sales data is pretty hard to come by for those. GTA Advance's critical reception wasn't very positive either, making it up until the, again, heavy air quote, definitive editions of the PS2 trilogy, the lowest scoring GTA as well. Honestly, it's a shame, because I think this game maybe got just a bit too much flack. Altogether, GTA Advance is fun and surprisingly meaty as a game. Honestly, it's excluding Chinatown Wars, my favorite of the top-down GTA experiences. It does run into some clear issues where the game tries to pull a pseudo-3D vibe by having you drive under some of the bridges or overpasses, the stuff they couldn't tweak or remove from the GTA 3 map. Whenever you do drive underneath those overpasses, your vehicle just flickers like crazy rather than, say, a dithering effect to appear translucent, and that flickering adds to the feeling that you'll probably get overall when playing, which is that it feels really choppy at points, despite not actually being choppy. It's smooth to control, vehicles feel really responsive, and the handbrake is satisfying to no end for drifts, and they actually try to give your vehicles an extra sense of weight and bounce by shifting that weight onto one set of wheels or the other during harsh turns. I wouldn't call the controls A+, this game's very clearly one of the reasons why a game like Chinatown Wars added a lane tracking feature, but it feels surprisingly strong, befitting of a game that's honestly a fully featured GTA experience, just minus weapon lock-on, replacing that with a goofy little strafe feature. And it should be considered at least close to a full GTA game, between its 41 main missions, a bevy of side missions and races, it's got a full stat screen akin to the console games, but this one instead tells you the total number of missions, rampages, races, not-so-hidden packages, and so on, so that you're not questioning what you're missing if you want to go for the 100%. It's even got three save slots on this little GBA cart, which honestly feels impressive. Obviously, there's no radio, that's probably the biggest real GTA omission. Instead, each type of car has its own instrumental theme, usually based on tracks from the original versions of GTA 1 or 2. Did you know, by the way, that the original GTA's theme was made by an in-universe band named Slum Pussy? You're welcome. But no matter how smooth it feels to play, the visuals never really share that smoothness, and that makes everything feel weaker overall. The world's got a cool blend of 2D sprites for cars and characters, and 3D models for the city's buildings, and that's really where the hitching begins. The GBA just can't handle that all that well, especially with an auto camera feature that zooms your view out as you speed up so that you can see more of the map ahead of you, meaning that this game also then has to render even more on screen at once, plus the zoom a bit too rapid, which also adds to that choppy feeling. Between that and the minimap choosing to go with the roads being transparent, presumably because a semi-opaque gray wouldn't really be possible, and covering up the top left corner of your screen permanently might cause the occasional gameplay issue if there was a character or something behind that minimap, well, there's no good solution to that problem essentially, but it makes it harder for you to keep your bearings at all times because you kind of have to focus your eyes on where you are on the minimap. All of that's not going to help you navigate at full speed without constantly slowing down and speeding back up, which in turn zooms the game in and out more and more, and will just make you more disoriented. It's weird seeing a game with a stable frame rate that still feels choppy, but that's exactly what's going on here. 
Also, your character has hilariously off-model wimpy legs while sprinting. The story for GTA Advance puts you in the shoes of some random dude named Mike who's working a bunch of small criminal jobs with his friend Vinny so that they can put together enough money to leave Liberty City and their current criminal lifestyle. Naturally, the way to get out of a life of crime is to start working with the Mafia, which is what they do up until Vinny is killed by a car bomb. While trying to find out who killed his friend, Mike runs into a bunch of characters that help him investigate, if he does some mostly timed missions for them, of course. My main criticism of this GBA game is that so many missions are timed, because the times can get pretty tight given the weak weapon aiming. I actually found it preferable to just stay in my car and run targets over half the time, but when the only challenge is battling the controls on a time limit, that's not really the fun kind of challenge. The mission variety is going to be more akin to those top-down games, of course. I mean, we're in a series where half of the missions tend to be drive from point A to B to kill some dudes, then drive back anyway, so it's not like mission variety is GTA's strong suit, but without dialogue to help fill that white noise, and with the top-down perspective limiting visual variety, it was always gonna feel a bit weaker. Which, I guess to Chinatown Wars' credit looking back, they did nail that variety, maybe overcorrecting from this game's influence. The rest of the plot is your standard GTA affair. There's your usual betrayal, Vinny faked his death to take Mike's share of the money and leave the city, Mike takes down a cartel leader and then flees to Columbia with all the money he took after killing Vinny as payback. I will say one other fun note about this game is that it's more or less the only GTA game in this 3D universe that allows you to make a couple narrative choices. It's not like they affect the plot to any significant degree, but they are there. This game's full of weird little trivia like that. Like, here's one more. To this day, GTA Advance is one of only two fully exclusive GTA games, as every other one besides this and one of GTA 1's two London expansions has been ported somewhere else. Although, as a fun little poke, apparently one of GTA Online's in-game arcade games reuses some of Mike's wimpy little running animations and sprites, so that's, that's kind of neat. So of the six games in GTA's portable library, two of them aren't playable in any form without emulation or buying a physical copy. Liberty City Stories and Chinatown Wars both exist on phone and tablet app stores with some minor changes, same as the mobile ports of the console trilogy. But Vice City Stories, for the foreseeable future, is sitting in limbo alongside GTA Advance. And the Game Boy Color ports, I suppose, but I mean, come on. Outside of Switch or iPhone ports of the console games, or I guess now also just the existence of the Steam Deck, that is the full history of Grand Theft Auto's portable ports, spin-offs, prequels, the whole slate of games you can play handheld. To me, it's a shame that this experimental era is one we won't get to return to for the foreseeable future, now that every GTA game needs 10 years, thousands of likely unpaid crunchy overtime hours, and billions of dollars worth of budget just to get a likely disappointing single-player experience that's lumped in with GTA Online. Hope you like your shark cards. These games weren't all hits, and I'm kind of a little sad now that a bit of my Chinatown Wars nostalgia was shattered when I replayed it for this video, but it was so fun going back and seeing the evolution of the console games by way of the stories counterparts, games that I hadn't played before, games that if you really look at it were the holdovers until GTA 4, the kind of holdovers we don't see anymore with the series. And it's not like we could get holdovers anymore, even San Andreas' whopping 25 plus million sales would be a flop by GTA 5 standards. The series has become the commercialized product that it was often satirizing, and as a result it's kinda hard for them to be able to justify greenlighting smaller projects anymore. Maybe that last part's a story for another day, and probably one another person is better equipped to tell because I'm good on GTA for a while. Make sure to share your memories of some of these portable GTA games in the comments below, I would love to read them. Thanks for watching, and as always, until next time, stay golden. A special thanks to my wonderful crew of Patreon supporters for helping make videos like this possible. If you'd like your name on this list along with access to the exclusive Discord server, early and ad-free videos, and more, you can do so for as little as a dollar a month over at patreon.com slash thegoldenbolt. Thank you.